Uh, I'm going to be talking more about behavior and energy efficiency, which is more broadly the subject of the research I did when I was a partner at McKinsey & Company. Um, taking a look at behavioral barriers to energy efficiency and what I'm going to call the rational irrationality of energy efficiency. Uh, most of my thoughts and my, my work in this space and my research are influenced heavily by behavioral economists like Dan Kahneman, uh, the great work uh, recently published and formerly published by Dan Ariely uh, and Ian Ayers. So thanks to all of those guys for their very interesting books. And of course, uh, Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler and their book Nudge, which is, I think, an outstanding book for those of you who've read it. So I'm going to talk a lot about those ideas and how they impact energy efficiency and what prevents us from going after pursuing those sorts of opportunities. First, to set this all in context, I think everybody here is well aware of the perspective impacts of climate change. Uh, and the, the prospects here are generally pretty grim. We have the, the future that would have quite a lot more uh, storms of much more violent nature, the warming itself uh, leading to reduced productivity across the globe. We have the prospect of reduced economic productivity, fishing, other industries that would be affected. And we look at all of that and we say that future for us is fairly grim. But wait, there's good news. Uh, this research published in 2005 by McKinsey takes a look at the global opportunities for greenhouse gas abatement. And if you take a look at those opportunities, here are arrayed on a traditional cost curve, where the x-axis represents the, the amount of greenhouse gas abatement potential, and the y-axis represents the cost per ton of carbon that would have to be spent above a business's usual case to be able to abate all of that carbon. What we find is there's actually enough opportunity below the price point of $50 per ton of carbon to be able to contain global warming to less than 2 degrees. That should be very good news to most people. We should be able to say there's a massive problem sitting out there, but we have solutions in hand today for not very much money that will help us fix those problems. Above and beyond that, quite a lot of this opportunity is actually net negative in cost, meaning that you save more money by investing in that so that you actually get paid for abating carbon. We ought to take a look at that opportunity, which is largely the opportunity of energy efficiency, and say this is even better news. Not only can we do everything we need to do to control the impact that we're having on the climate, but we can do so and make money at the same time. So the question that then arises is, how can that possibly continue to persist? That opportunity still hangs out there, and if you take a look at global emissions over the same time frame, they've continued to rise fairly relentlessly. So we're not going after that opportunity. We know it's coming. We know it's going to be a disaster. We know what the solution is, and yet we stand there and wait. We have built-in irrational biases that help us make our decisions quickly and speedily in a way that is often self-preserving, but is not always great and rational for long-term decision making, and is not always terribly rational. How many people in this room typically look forward to a tax refund in April, assuming you're not in the 47%? And how many people in this room set a budget for their cell phone minutes and don't pay overage charges because they don't run over their minutes every month? You know, it's an interesting combined instinct that gives you both of those things. If you think about the instinct to pay more money in taxes today and then get a refund from the government later, that's actually tremendously irrational. What you ought to do from a financially rational standpoint is pay as little tax as humanly possible today. It's interest-free credit from the government and then write a big check the following April. But almost nobody does that, because the pain of writing a big check, even though it's your money that you've held for free now for a year, is something that people really dislike doing. Paying overage charges on cell phone minutes actually gives you the reverse. It makes you set a budget that you pick for yourself, and then behave in accordance to that budget every month, so you don't have to spend 35 cents a minute or 50 cents a minute as you go over. And that helps us avoid a lot of these behavioral biases the heuristics or rules of thumb that we tend to adhere to that help us make quick snap decisions. One of the key challenges in energy efficiency is that there are just so many choices. When you take a look at the opportunity to, say, retrofit a home, or even better yet, to go retrofit an industrial process to be able to save your energy, there are so many different initiatives that you could possibly pursue. You might look at that and say, choice is great. What we really want to be able to do is have a lot of different opportunities so you can pick and choose off the menu and decide to do what is best for you. But what we discover is actually that too many choices often prevents action. We have a little paralysis that happens when we are presented with too many options. Some interesting research done by Sheena Iyengar, presented in her book, The Art of Choosing, conducted a study on participants who were shopping for jam. What they did is people who came into a grocery store were presented with one of two options, either six jars of jam and flavors, 
or 24. Those who were presented with a multitude of options, only 3% of those people actually went on to buy jam. And of those who were presented with six options, 30% went on to go buy jam. What our research shows us is that sometimes when we're presented with too many options, it gets very confusing. Unfortunately, in energy efficiency, we're actually moving to a world of even more choosing, a world that wants even more consumer engagement and expects people to stare at their home usage in a variety of different applications and make minute-by-minute -minute decisions based on real-time pricing of electricity. Is that realistic? Is it meant to be something like this so that you can run your home? Or do we think it'll be something more like this? These are very complicated decisions, and having to allocate a large portion of your mind to operating your basic home for the savings of a few pennies a day is probably not something that works well with the way our minds work. So one option is to smooth out the decision points. Take, for instance, the classic wine of the month club. The wine of the month club is an easy way to sign up on day one to go and do something that you may not choose to do again every month, but you're going to pre-select, smooth out all those decision points so you don't constantly have to be faced with that choice. The Wine of the Month Club has been so popular that there's actually a Cake of the Month Club, Candles of the Month Club, a Beer of the Month Club. There's even a Sock of the Month Club. Because in case you didn't know, you are supposed to buy a new pair of socks every month. What about a Retrofit of the Month Club? What if we made this much easier? Rather than every time having to decide what you wanted to go and do, you signed up for something in advance and then move forward with that on a regular schedule. More realistically, there are also options for set it and forget it. So programmable thermostats, and I will confess in my home there are three Harvard degrees and our programmable thermostat is never right. But a programmable thermostat is supposed to let you set it and forget it. More creatively, Nest is a company that's bringing to, to market a thermostat that is able to learn from your experiences. So you don't need to set it, it will learn from your behavior and then control your home comfortably for you, saving energy as you go. We have another issue also, which is how we frame things and what are relative comparison points. So when is enough enough? And that's something our brains are not very good at judging. One of the studies um, that's conducted by Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein shows that if you eat alone, you eat a certain amount of food. If you eat with one other person, you tend to eat about 35% more food. If you eat with four people, you eat 75% more food. And nine or more people actually pushes you to almost double the amount of food you would normally have eaten. Presumably, that's not because you're so much hungrier when you add all those people to the crowd. So how do you know when you've had enough? This is a challenge that our brains typically face. How many people know how many kilowatt hours they spent on electricity last month? <laughs> that's pretty good, and this is South by Southwest Eco. How many people know if that is too much? Relative to your neighbors, how are you doing? You must be in a market with O-Power bills. So one of the interesting experiments conducted in San Marcos, California, on a set of 300 households was to actually benchmark people against homes in their neighborhood for energy consumption. And to be able to tell them, rather than 500 kilowatt hours or 700 kilowatt hours, to be able to say you're using relatively more or relatively less than the amount of energy consumed by your neighbors. Interestingly, what people found is when they first launched that without the emoticons, and they said you're just using more or less, Predictably, those who used more actually curbed some of their energy consumption behavior. But those who used less went in the other direction and normalized back to the mean. They said, heck, even though I thought I needed the energy before, I'm going to use even more because I'm so much better than my neighbors. They were able to address this, though, by adding smiley faces and, yes, actually frowny faces. And so what they did is on the bills of people who were using less than their neighbors, they got a smiley face. And interestingly, that actually curbed the behavior of increasing your energy consumption just for the completely non-material reward of seeing a little yellow smiley face on your bill. People tend to take the path of least resistance. I know this because since Amazon introduced one-click buying, my buying with Amazon has skyrocketed. This is an interesting study conducted at Yale where they uh, went through and did a student seminar on the importance of tetanus boosters. And explained to all the students that if you went to the health center, you could have a free tetanus booster. It was very important to go and do, and everybody should go out and do it. It turned out that once given that set of instructions and just the requirement, 3% of students then actually followed up, went to the health center, and got a tetanus booster. When that set of instructions was accompanied by a map, very simple map, and these are students at Yale, so presumably they know how to get to the health center anyway without the map, that number actually went up to 28%. So just a little bit of assistance in creating the path of least resistance, putting the information directly in front of people, helps make this much, much easier. And it matters where you start. 
So making it the path of least resistance is also about altering the framework from which you start making your decision. If you think about organ donation, for instance, this is a study that's often been cited, in the opt-out model, where everybody starts out in as a donor and has to specifically register to opt out, Austria, which uses that model, has 99% participation for organ donation. Germany, which uses an opt-in model, has a 12% participation rate. And so you would think that your decision on whether or not you're willing to donate organs should not be affected by the starting point or the power of suggestion from which you start. But making something the path of least resistance can have a very powerful impact. At my company, we actually use an opt-out program on 401ks because we think it's important to encourage people to save. And we have 87% participation. So one way of making this the path of least resistance, since energy efficiency is by its very nature rather difficult, is actually to make something else much more complicated. Uh, take a look at STIC, which is an interesting website set up by Ian Ayers and two of his partners at Yale, which allows you to make a public commitment that you have to adhere to. In this particular case, we have a gentleman who is interested in insulating his attic. And he's made that energy efficiency promise to himself that he is going to get out there and insulate his attic to save money, which he hasn't been able to do without this public commitment. Interestingly here, you can actually pledge some money to an anti-charity. So what he has posted is a $100 commitment. And if he fails to insulate his attic while everybody is watching, that $100 goes to the super PAC supporting Mitt Romney. <laughs> Talk about powerful incentives. So how can we finally go after a lot of these energy efficiency opportunities? The trick is really in outsmarting ourselves. These are not easy projects to go after. The rational decision is not always the easy thing to do. But learning from behavioral approaches can help us make this a lot smoother. Thanks. Uh, your opinion on um, the ability to smooth your bill out over the entire year and pay an average when you live in a climate where your energy consumption is dominated either winter or summer when it comes to energy efficiency upgrades. And then and also in addition to that, um, you know, adding an extra $10 the next year per month and what, what does that mean to people and how does that influence their perception on energy efficiency. So let's actually, let's take a quick poll of the room. How many people here budget for their July air conditioning bill? So not that many people take a look at their bills and say, I know that my bill follows a peak like this through the year. Or people who do, particularly in colder climates, will often say, well, my gas bill follows a pattern like this and it sort of offsets itself. Um, in general, I think smoothing a bill doesn't necessarily give you a good price signal one way or another because people who look at their electricity bills tend to look at them and recognize the pattern, and people who don't look at their electricity bills don't really pay attention to their electricity bills. It's a helpful budgeting tool for people who want to make sure that they're able to pay their bill every month, but I'm not sure that it does a lot to actually curb usage. I'd be interested in seeing some more actual data on it, though. You can hang on for the microphone for a second because we're recording. Thanks. I was just going to add something to what you were saying earlier about emoticons or whatever. The bills that have the bars on them that show you what you used this month versus last year at this month helps a lot to compare whether you've done well or not. So it makes a difference to me. And I do budget and see how it goes and then look at those simple little graphs that are on the bills. It makes a difference. Absolutely. I think being able to break down the analytics, as I'm sure many of you knew, know, doing, uh, doing energy analysis is an incredibly complicated thing. Um, but having a simple number that just says, is it better or is it worse, which is what you're looking at with the bar graph, is a great way to give people a simple cue. Um, can you uh, let me know what you think of um, recommendations which are based on or what's already happened? Like last month, you spent more than your neighbors versus to do something right now in order so that you don't do that again. What do you think? Is that possible? What do you think? You, it is interesting to get something more in real time because, you know, as, as you're alluding to, there's a lag in your electricity bill. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, as companies have tried to compress the cycle over which they collect their cash, typically that bill comes to you now immediately at the close of the month rather than, say, uh, a month later. So you get reasonably quick feedback. But being able to see immediately might actually be very helpful. The challenge in the energy space is that if you do three things this week, you may or may not actually see your energy bill go down based on what the weather looked like, based on 
other factors going on in your building that you may not be aware of. It's a lot like crash dieting and you say, I've been working so hard on dieting all week, but I gained two pounds at the end of the week. It can be something that's very frustrating to people when they look at it on a minute by minute basis. So I think there's some potential there also for being counterproductive. All the way back. So one of the things that we find in, in the energy sector a lot is that incentives don't usually work. So somebody getting a, a happy face on their on their bill isn't really an incentive. It's more of a communication tool. Mm -hmm. And um, does your research suggest that incentives do or do not work? Um, and just mere communication seems to have a much higher effect. Does, does that make sense? Is that, does your research support that right now? It does. You know, actually, one of the things that's interesting, um, not only about this space, but more broadly about a lot of the research that's done in behavioral economics, is that there's a very big mental difference between doing something for no money and doing something for some amount of payment. If you think about the opportunities in energy efficiency, they all pay back anyway. So you really, you don't, you shouldn't need an additional incentive on top of that because you're already being paid by the energy savings. And that in itself doesn't seem to be quite enough. A lot of folks have talked about price signal as a way to handle this, but one of the issues is the cost of electricity is so low that what you'd have to get that price signal to would be wildly unrealistic in most developed countries. And so something that implies more of a social norm as opposed to a financial norm can help you make a difference in how you judge those things. There's actually some very interesting coverage of, of this particular phenomenon in Dan Ariely's book, Predictably Irrational. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. <laughs>